First of all, I just wanted to start, um, who uh, inspired you to start writing novels after you graduated from law school? Well, you know, I'd always loved reading. I mean, I've been a big reader since the time I was yay big. Um, and so, uh, and I think reading was my first inspiration to become a writer. So the books I read were so varied. I mean, it was um, Little House on the Prairie by Laura Ingall Wilder, um, The Boxcar Children, uh, Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, the never any story. I mean, just all these these books that I I soaked in, you know, over my life. Um, all the stories that I just loved made me want to tell my own stories. And so it wasn't just one author, but it was it was just a whole lifetime of reading. And you know, I all through high school, all through my life, I'd, I'd had this big dream. I want to be a writer. I want to be a writer for a living. But you know, I I um, my my dad's an immigrant. And my mom is a practical Midwesterner, and so the two, yeah. the two meet in the middle, and yeah. and produced you know a child who was very practical, and I knew I had to have a very practical profession, mm. and so um, so I went to law school, and I love law school, but I I just knew in my heart of hearts that this was not what I wanted to do with the rest of my life, and I was I was lucky, um, you know I am lucky to be be doing what I am, but basically what happened was in the third year of law school I. I, this voice entered my head and said, if you're going to do, if you're going to try anything else, now is the time. And so I graduated, I was accepted into the bar. And while I was looking for legal work, um, I said, okay, well, I'm going to write, I'm going to write my novel. And I've been trying to write a novel for years, and I was never able to finish it. But by some miracle, this was the one time I was able to finish writing my novel. And I wrote it really fast. I was very driven and just started sending it out and, and was in the right place at the right time. And was it hard to let that law career go? Like no. What, what, no. <laughs> no, what I don't you, even need to let you finish the question. Right. I'm like, no. <laughs> what did, you, what did you, like your family and, and, and your you say you have that sort of immigrant and Midwesterner mm -hmm. background. It must have come as a bit of a shock to say, I'm going to oh, let yes. this lucrative law career I didn't tell them what I was doing. No, <laughs> I did not tell them what I was doing. I kept it. Um, I kept it a secret, and I wrote my novel in a secret, and I sent it out in secret. And when it was fine, when I finally sold my novel, um, I even you know waited until I, I got my agent before I before I said anything. And I you know I was like, oh, you know, I, I sold my first book. Oh wow! And they were like, well, they were fan they were they were thrilled for me. They were absolutely thrilled. But um, they're like, well. Well, okay, and I and I said, well, you know, it's a four book deal, and I think I'm going to write full time. And they're yeah. like, <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> but but you're a lawyer, you know, you just you have this brand spanking new law degree, you know, yeah. you're you're a new lawyer. What are you going to do with this? And I was like, well, I'm going to write full time. And they finally they they've come around, but I, I know in the beginning it was hard for them because. Um, I'd spent all this time getting this education, and it was a big deal. You know, there were no other lawyers in the family. It was, you know, it's, I was the first person to go to law school, and and um, and I, you know, my family had a lot invested in that, and uh, and I think. Every now and then, every now and then, my dad still says, "Well, when you go back to practicing law, <laughs> he just throws that into the conversation," and um, and I'm like, "Ho ha ha ha!" <laughs> you, you could do something for the comic book legal defense fund just to sort of keep him happy. I could. So every so often, I could. Yeah. I could. And I will say, there are times when I feel a little wistful when I think about what could have been. I mean, I I wouldn't give up my life for anything. I love what I do. I, I love being a writer. I love the the luxury and, and the freedom of writing full time. Um, I mean, it's incredibly stressful too, but it's it's also it's also a luxury. Um, but I I do think every now and then, oh well, if I'd stay a lawyer, um, you know, I would I would know how to do this and this and this and this. But I've been out of the legal field now for so long that even though I am still a lawyer, I still keep up my license. Um, I would not. Wish me on my worst enemy, <laughs> <laughs> as far as representation oh, right goes. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Okay. Well, um, what, now, what's your favorite part of the the process of, of writing from from the, oh, the novel writing days? I, everything is is. Uh, gosh, um, that's a good question. I think. To some degree, every part of the process brings me a great amount of joy. I mean, I, I love coming up with new ideas. I love the brainstorming. I love you know figuring out how all the puzzle pieces fit. And sometimes, 
and the best thing for me is just to come up with a great first sentence and like have an idea at the back of my head, come up with a first sentence, and then just go from there and see what happens without a plan. And that's fun. That's like free falling. It's it's wonderful. Um, and I love it, you know, in the part of the process when when the story is flowing and things are moving fast, and I I feel the energy of, of the book coming together. That's fantastic. Um, I love revising. You know, at that point, the book is done. You know, I feel like when I reach revision stage, everything's everything's over. I can breathe, and I can. And then when I revise, it's just the process of making things better and filling in the blanks, and that's a tremendous fun for me as well. So. I do become stressed as I write a book. I think, I think as a lot of writers do, um, because you always reach, you always reach those that that point when exhaustion and when exhaustion hits, and and you're not quite sure what happens next, and you start beating yourself up and saying, "Oh, what was me? You know, this is trash. What am I going to do?" But once you get past that, everything's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how does the comic writing compare to the? Uh to the, the fiction writing? It's very different. Um, both require uh, storytelling skills. Um, but a comic book is, generally speaking, about 20 pages long. And half the burden is carried by your artist. And so you can write, you write the script, and, and you, you, know, you, you describe, you write the story, you write the script, the lettering, all that. But, but then your job is done. And you have an artist there who is who, who picks up half the burden, who is responsible for creating the world and, and creating that visual element. Whereas when you're writing a novel, you are responsible for, for painting the world and for making sure the reader can live in it. And so the responsibility is, is, is huge and it's all on you. And it's definitely an endurance race because a novel is 100,000 words, you know, between 70,000 and 100,000 words, about 400 pages. And that's... That's a lot different. That's it's 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 definitely a, a different beast. Do you think mm -hmm. about the, um, the the sort of the long haul and the overarching um, stories in in the comics, like say the, the oh yes. the, you know the six issue runs and what have you, in a, in a similar way to novels, sort of like yeah. yeah. I mean, actually, writing comic books has made me a better plotter for my novels because I was always a seats. I mean, I still am to some degree. I write by the seat of my pants. Um, I have a general idea of, of where the story will go and what I want to do, but then I just sit down, I write, and see what happens. You can't, you can't really do that as easily with comics because once you turn in the script, the artist draws. You can't really go back and revise. You can revise the lettering, but you can't, you can't revise the art. Unlike a novel, you can keep going back and fixing things and fixing things. But you know, once you turn in the script, it's pretty much set in stone, and, and having a plan is necessary. Also, just because everything is, you know, we're working on, on future covers, we're working on, on, you know, future, you know, descriptions for the catalogs, so you need to know what's going to happen, you know, at least a couple issues in advance. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's just part of the, it's part of the skill set. Now, who's been your, your favorite character to write in the X-Men universe? Oh, my gosh. Um, I love them all. See... I haven't been reading comics as long as some people. I, I, I didn't start reading comics until I was 18, but I was totally, totally in love with the cartoon. I don't, the Fox cartoon that came on in the oh, 90s. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. It's great. Okay, so everyone's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. So my favorite character was always Jubilee. Yeah. I love Jubilee. I mean, I also love Wolverine, but Jubilee was just my favorite. She was this street smart, funny, take no prisoners kid who also happened to be Chinese. And I just, you know, she, I just loved her. And so, um, and I still, I think, I, I have to say, she is probably one of my favorite characters to write. But then I also love X-23. Yeah. X-23 was so close to my heart. I loved writing that character. Loved writing Black Widow. Um, Dokken in, in the Dark Wolverine run was just a fantastic character to play with. So really, I, I have to say, it's, it's, it's a little bit of, I, I don't mean it to be a cop-out, but I, I will say that almost every character that I've, that I've focused on, that I, I write, I fall in love with. So it's very hard for me to separate them all and say, okay, no, this is my favorite, no, this is my favorite, because they're all dear to me in different ways. And uh, X-23 and, and mm -hmm. Dakin, those two characters in particular, became sort of massively popular. Um, were you prepared for that sort of success quite early on in the, in the comic? Uh, uh, industry? No, I mean, it wasn't even a matter of preparation. It was more because I was keeping my head down. Like, I didn't think about it that way. I was just, 
really in love with writing these characters. And so, you know, I was telling these stories, and like Dan and I, when we were working on Dark Old Marine, we were just having a good time. Because this was a character, Dawkins was a character where you could do so much with him. He was psychotic, he, was, he could be good, he could be bad, he was sexy, he could, was sleeping with men and women. So we could just throw so much at him and just play. And so I don't think any of it, we weren't really thinking about the success of the book more, more so we were just having fun. And I, I guess that, that, that hopefully anyway translated you know, over to the reader. Um, and it's the same thing with X-23. I was having so much fun writing the character and I was so invested in her that I didn't, I didn't think about um, how the book was doing. I was just trying to tell the best story I could. How does it feel to have become successful in, in such a male-dominated industry in, in comics? Well, um, good. Good. <laughs> not bad. I mean, not bad. I mean, what am I going to say? Yeah. Um, I mean, no success is ever bad. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, regardless of the industry. Um, it, it is interesting because writing romance novels and urban fantasy novels, it's very female oriented side of publishing. Mm. And then it's true, you come over to comic books and, and, it, and the, the image of comic, the comic book industry is very male, male oriented, male dominated. But at the same time, my editor's a woman, my editorial assistant was a woman. Um, I work with a lot of women in comics. And so, and I, I know a lot of women who are writing wonderful comics. And so it's, I think my perception of it is a bit different because even though the outside world says it's male dominated. From the inside, looking out, yes, in certain respects, it is male dominated because you, you know, especially at the big two, Marvel and DC, there aren't that many women writers. I mean, compared to, compared to, if I'm just looking at writers, yeah. if we separate writers from the artists and, and all the other parts of, of, of writing comic book. If we're just looking at writers um, at Marvel and DC, it's just a handful of us, you know, just literally a handful of us, um, and that is. I mean, that's something I think that, that hopefully in the future will change because women, you know, to be a little dramatic, you know, we carry half the imaginary of the world. And so if we're not being represented, um, you know, in, 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 I won't say, to, to, to say the right number sounds a little judgmental, but let's yeah. just say the right numbers, whatever, like more, more equal numbers, yeah. then uh, we're missing out on, on, on some, you know, some great storytellers. Um, do you think any more can be done to uh, to pave the way for, for female writers and more sort of accepting um, culture at the big two or something like that? Well, I, um, that's, well, it's a good question. It's a good question. It's a hard question to answer because uh, I think that I think that things are changing. I think it's um, and time time will continue to make more. I think as time continues, women will make more inroads in the comp in 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 superhero comics in the big two. Because if you're looking at indie comics, women are already like all over the place in indie comics. But if we're just speaking about superhero comics at Marvel and DC, I think it's just, I think it's a matter of time. Yeah. How do you approach um, writing what could be like potentially like an absolutely massive ensemble cast? Sort of how, do you, how do you go selecting who to work with and, and, and how are you gonna use the X-Men? It was a learning curve. Um, the books I'd written prior to this were all um, pretty much all solo books, and and I they were solo books, but I would bring in other characters. And so X twenty three, I brought in Gambit, I brought in um, you know I brought in Jubilee at some point in Wolverine, but it was still very much a solo book. And it took me I, I feel like it took me a, a a little bit of time to get my footing to figure out you know the best way to approach a team book, like how how to structure it so everyone got their due. And it wasn't confusing, and uh, and but as far as the the characters themselves, I chose characters that I thought would be interesting to write, and that I thought would be interesting together. Because for me, the best way to explore a character is through their relationships, you know. And so um, so we had all you know we had Iceman, we had Gambit, we had Wolverine, all of whom have this interesting like dynamic together. Um, and then, you know, I chose my favorites. I've always been, I've always loved Cecilia Reyes, Dr. Reyes, and yeah. so I just really wanted to write her, really wanted to write Karma. Um, and I was fascinated with uh, Jason Aaron's Warbird, which showed up in Wolverine and the X-Men. Mm -hmm. So part of it was, part of it was, was um, and of course, North Star. I mean, yeah. the, whole, the whole gay wedding was the basis of yeah. the, first, the first arc. 
and sort of structured everything that followed. Um, but I had these, you know, so some of it was deliberate and some of it was just, well, I really like this character and I'm going to you know, bring this person in and just see what happens. And uh, did the more sort of prevalent romance angle from that's it always been in the X Men books? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the biggest love triangle in comics when I was growing up, anyway, was Cyclops, <laughs> Wolverine, and, and Phoenix. And you know, yeah. um, so was that something that uh, that appealed to you that you were excited to, to play with coming into the the books? Oh, I I'm like a romance fiend. Yeah, <laughs> like I I don't, I'm not shy to say it. I mean, I I write romance novels. I love writing romantic relationships and, and playing with with um, sexuality and playing with, with sort of attraction and seeing how that, how that, how that works out for, for characters. And sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But even as the story's unfolding, um, I don't always have a plan. It's just, it sort of depends, you know, while I'm working, how I feel. And, and if something crops up in my mind, I think, okay, well, I'll put this in there and see what happens, you know. And sometimes it's, it's deliberate, sometimes an accident. And then, but the great thing is that readers can play. You know, readers are, the readers, especially of, of comic books, the X-Men, are really good at sort of picking out, like, implied relationships and, and just picking out little story bits they like and then just expanding on them. And, um, and so I, I felt like I, I did my job well if I, if I gave the, the readers something to sort of play with. And um, the North Star, Astonishing X-Men mm -hmm. um, arc, obviously there was massive press attention around mm -hmm. it and what have you, was... Was it easy to, like you said, just have fun and script the comic and, and get it out there, or was there any more uh, any more pressure on you when when that book was coming out? It was fun, but there was some pressure because uh, we all knew that there would be many eyes on it, and we weren't quite sure what the reception would be. Um, the reception ended up being way more positive than than we even thought it would be. Thankfully, yeah. Um, but at the time, we weren't quite sure, and so we were sort of. We thought very carefully about um, about certain things, um, about how to approach certain angles in the story, uh, and uh, but in some ways it wasn't any more. It, in some ways it wasn't any more pressure than writing Black Widow, um, because Black Widow at the time was going to be in um, uh, Iron Man Two. Yeah, she was going to be in yeah. Iron Man Two, and so they were thinking about the possibility down the road of her having her own movie. And so they wanted her book, they wanted a book that, that would be accessible to a lot of different people, but also um, highlight the character in a new, exciting way. And so that was also, it's it, different kinds of pressure, but still, you know, a lot of scrutiny on the story. And when you're writing your, your novels, obviously the, the continuity that you are um, creating is, is your own, you, it's your mm -hmm. own universe to play with. Um, with comics, it's a little bit different, mm -hmm. I suppose. Every, every Every story is like a butterfly flapping its wings, and like somewhere down the road, it's, Pretty much. it's gonna, it might create you know yeah. problems for people, or not necessarily problems, but it's gonna, someone's gonna have to plot around something. Continuity, that you've already what's done. continuity? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like so, it was continuity something you sort of threw out the window, and you're like, okay, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna write my X Men books, and um, and that's that. <laughs> no, I, I I try to pay attention to continuity. I mean, there's some things you just can't help because the X Men universe is so convoluted. I mean, at a certain point, you just have to throw up your hands and say, yeah. okay, you know, I'm going to pick and choose. I'm, I'm going to try to stay true to, to readers and, and what's happened before. But at a certain point, you just have to pick and choose what, what will work for your story because there's so much. I mean, think about Betsy Braddock. I mean, she's, you know, like, what, you know, now she's like a ninja. Now she's like Japanese. Yeah. Like, she's, what was it? She's like, you know, all these weird, crazy things. She has bionic eyes. I can't remember everything that's happened to her. She's Scottish in Ultimate yeah, X Men as well. Like, or something yeah, like there's that. all yeah. these crazy things that happened to her. And at a certain point, you just have to be like, okay, <laughs> you know, I surrender. But, and I surrender, and so does everyone else around me. Because yeah. <laughs> you don't have a choice yeah. because there's only so much a, a, a writer can do. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, in so much as the, the feedback from the North Star wedding mm -hmm. issue, um, how was the the feedback from the from the gay community in particular? Oh, well, the gay community was great. Yeah. I, I mean, as far uh, at least as far as the response I saw, yeah. um, everyone was incredibly positive, um, and uh, just just pleased that that there was yet another affirmation of what um, of what 
you know, so many people believe to be true that this yeah. is like a civil rights issue, you know, and that um, yeah. I think about my own parents who got married just 10 years after the Supreme Court had had finally declared it um, illegal to ban mixed race marriages. I mean, just 10 years. Why? And at that time, they faced a huge amount of uh, prejudice. Um, and uh, but that was, you know, for me, I I, I feel like it's this, a very it's a very similar a very similar thing, mixed race marriages, gay marriages, either way it's, you know, it's people who are in love, who are consenting adults who want to get married. I mean, like, it's okay. Like, yeah. uh, and, and that sort of uh, your parents' uh, struggles back then, is that something that you've introduced into your novels? And oh, I think, I think without a doubt, it's not something I, I sit with consciously, at least I, I didn't used to. Now I think, now that I'm older and it's, it's more on my mind and I, mm. I but I think for many years, um, if I look at the themes that were showing up in my novels, it was always, it was always themes of otherness, and you know, um, people who were who who were who were outsiders, who were sort of the alien, who were you know the 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 monster, the immigrant, whatever you know, whatever metaphor you want to use, yeah. um, sort of finding love and finding acceptance and finding trust and you know sort of against the odds and so i think i think very much that was that was part of my work even if i wasn't consciously aware of it and uh, what are your uh, building blocks for creating realistic relationships in uh, fantasy fiction <laughs> i don't i don't overthink it to be no. honest it's like i just write and um, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're writing about, like, gargoyles falling in love with, with human women or mermen, you yeah. know, falling in love with human women, I mean, like, it's, <laughs> you, you try to stick with the, the same building blocks of any relationship, you know, it's, again, yeah. like, you know, trust, acceptance, um, love, what, you know, all, yeah. but, but then there's this crazy <laughs> fantasy element that comes in, so it's, it's, it's not something, it's hard for me, it's, I, I will admit, it's very hard for me to articulate. I'm sure some yeah. people could have like this, this great like, argument for like, you know, this great description of what they do. For me, I fly more by the seat of my pants and I yeah. just write what feels right. Are you sort of, do you ever feel like you're on the pre precipice of like, how deep am I prepared to go into, into let's say, you know, gargoyles falling in love with, with women? <laughs> like, how, how, how far are you going to go into you know, gargoyles and the traditions of gargoyles and I don't know, the, oh, the, like I, how far down the rabbit hole you want to go with all that sort of stuff. Oh, I think it's, I think go yeah. down as far as you want to. I yeah. think for any, I think for any writer, for me and for any writer, I think do what feels right yeah. and don't hold yourself back. I think the biggest mistake a writer can make is, is to say, oh, you know, that's too much. I can't go there. Um, why not? Yeah. You know, I think if it's if it's too much, your editor will tell you. Yeah. Someone will tell you if you if you've gotten too freaky, you know, yeah. and you need to pull back. But but it's much easy. It's much it's it's much easier, I think, um, to go full out, you know, and 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 do all the crazy stuff and pour yourself into your book and do exactly what you want than to try to reintroduce that later, you know. And just when you're writing your book, be true to your instincts, no matter how in crazy your instincts might be. And then you can revise. That's the beautiful thing about what we do. It's the beautiful thing about the written word. It's not set in stone. I mean, maybe it was long ago, yeah. but not like now. Yes, in actual stone. not now. <laughs> like we, we, we have computers. We have you know we have erasers. We have we can mark things out. It's yeah. um, we can revise, and that's the beauty of it. You can be crazy and then take the crazy back, and and no one ever has to know. Yeah. Can you can you think of an example of um, a good piece of revision in Mar Marjorie Lee work? Oh gosh, uh, I mean, for the Iron Hunt, I think I wrote. I think there are probably five different versions of that book in existence. Why? Um, because I wrote the first draft and it was terrible. I wrote the second draft; it was a, a little bit better, but not much. Yeah. Third draft, completely different book, um, still not quite there. And I just kept going and going and going. I mean, it was, it was miserable. <laughs> that was not a happy <laughs> was, revision no, process. No. <laughs> I would say that was the worst revision process of my life. Yeah. But, um, but I was mostly happy with the, the final product. OK. Mm -hmm. What does the, uh, the future hold for Marjorie Lee? What have you got coming up? Well, I'm working on the next novel in my Hunter Kiss series. 
And the Hunter Kiss series is about a woman um, named Maxine Kiss who is surrounded, she's covered in living tattoos um, that peel off her body at night to form her own demonic army. And so that's that series. I'm writing the fifth book called Labyrinth of Stars, and that comes out in March 2014. Um, and my run on Astonishing X-Men is coming to an end. And the book is, is, is ending in October, I think. But I will be doing another book for Marvel that I can't speak about yet. Oh. <laughs> I wish yeah, I could. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be making announcements probably at New York Comic Con in October. Yeah, and you've written the second most issues of Astonishing after Joss Whedon as well. Did I did you not know, know that? that. I read that this morning. I yeah, really yeah. did not know that. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Yay! <Yeah. laughs>